So profit, purpose, and heart. And how do we bring these into alignment in times of change? Because we as a species, we're actually not really good at managing change. When motor vehicles were first invented in the law, in the 1865 Locomotive Act, we had to have a man, had to be a man, waving a red flag in front of a car, sort of defeating the purpose of traveling faster. And did you know, in some jurisdictions, the laws that required a person to walk in front of a motor vehicle with a red flag stayed on the statute books, although not enforced, until the early 2000s. Where I come from in Victoria, they only repealed that law in 2002. So as a species, we're not always good at seeing change. My culture, the white Anglo-Saxon Christian culture, can be particularly bad at seeing change. We can be particularly bad at seeing change, particularly when it happens outside of our cultural context. For example, we called the years 400 to 1400 the Dark Ages because the world went backwards. The problem with that narrative is the world didn't go backwards, just my culture did, just the white Anglo-Saxon Christians did. And let me give you a couple of examples. What was the Roman numeral for zero? It's a trick question. There wasn't one. How can you have the decimal system if you don't have the number zero? And the answer is you can't. Yet in the, in the year 795, the fella on the top left-hand side, Al Khorazamu, in a little town called Kiva in what's now modern-day Uzbekistan, didn't invent zero, but perfected its use and perfected algebra. Without his work in 795 in Uzbekistan, down the old Silk Road, we wouldn't have the decimal system of counting. Yet we didn't recognise that, and we don't read that in the history books in the white Anglo-Saxon culture, because there was an advancement that happened outside of our culture that we didn't recognise because we didn't do it. Likewise, what did you learn in school about who discovered the world was round? Most people learned it was Galileo. Put your hands up if you learned it was Galileo who discovered the world was round, not flat. The problem with that narrative is 200 years before Galileo, this fellow on the right, Mirzo Uligbek, in his observatory outside what's now Samarkand, again in Uzbekistan, discovered the world was round but it didn't happen in my culture, so my culture didn't accept it, and my culture didn't put it in the history books. My culture is very bad at seeing change happening outside of its own culture. My culture now talks about China rising, rather than returning, because we also don't always have a great historical perspective. Many people in my culture will look at a graph like this and say, clearly, the economy of China is rising, from 1980, less than 5% of the global economy. It's going to take over the United States. It's going to be the largest economy in the world. The problem with that narrative is if you then extend your time frame, extend your history out a little bit, let's go back to Jesus Christ. You see something completely different. Back in the year 1000, 1500, China and India combined were more than 60, some people say more than 80% of the global economy. When you actually go back in time, you see that China has come down and China is not rising. China is returning. India is not rising. India is returning. Why is this narrative important? Why is it important to look at the words and understand actually what's going on? And what caused this? Because before 1500, Individual productivity around the world was more or less the same. Before the Industrial Revolution, before the Scotsman invented his train, basically everyone in the world was a subsistence farmer. A few royals here and there, but basically the vast majority of people in the world were subsistence farmers. Individual productivity around the world was more or less the same, and in fact, your relative economic size and your relative population size as a country were in alignment. Your relative economic importance and your relative population importance were in alignment. But the Industrial Revolution, the invention of the steam train and all of these other things gave the white European Anglo-Saxons an enormous productivity boost. They just got lucky they invented that stuff first. 
And what they did with this enormous productivity boost is the age of empire, the age of colonialism, and we saw 500 years of dominance, 500 years of creating global commerce, creating the logistics trains and networks that we know today, and the culture of global trade was governed by those who ran it, which was the white Anglo-Saxon Christian tradition that governed global trade for 500 years. Now, why is China returning now? Why is India returning now? Because about 1950, more or less, we started the information age. And what did we do with the information age? We spread that knowledge about individual productivity. We removed the comparative advantage that the Europeans had in inventing the Industrial Revolution. From 1950 onwards, it's therefore not a question about knowledge of how to improve individual productivity, it's about implementation of that knowledge. So the world is returning to a position where your global population size and your global economic importance are coming back to alignment just as it always was before. And why is this important? I call this a once in a millennia historical rebalancing of the power of trade. We've done it before. We saw the Romans handing over, or the Greeks handing over to the Romans, the Romans to the Zoroastrians, the Zoroastrians to the Muslims, the Muslims to the different Khanates and empires up and down the Silk Road, for example. And here's something that we saw a lot of through these great transitions from Greeks to Romans, to Romans to the Zoroastrians, Zoroastrians to Muslims, to Muslims to the Industrial Revolution. And now as we transition through to an Asian dominance, something was consistent through all of these parts of the world, and that was trade. Trade went through cultures. Trade went through different religion, religious dominations. I call it the agnostic power of trade the agnostic power of trade that's driven by good logistics. We've seen it before, and we've seen it again, and it's happening now. We are seeing this historical rebalance between one cultural dominance and another cultural dominance based on information and individual productivity coming back into alignment. A global rebalancing between economic influence and population and this is why the current return of China and the return of India is not just about one economy growing strong, one economy returning, it's a cultural global rebalance. The changing culture of global trade is unfolding before our eyes today. But what will be the future culture of trade? What will it mean? What will it mean for the work that you do? What will it mean for purpose, profit, and heart. Now, some of you would have heard of China's One Belt, One Road policy and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. I'm going to overgeneralize it now. One Belt, One Road. President Xi stood up in 2013 and he announced a multi trillion dollar physical infrastructure investment program to link the belt of former Silk Road countries and a, a seaborne road linking Sub Saharan Africa through South Asia into China. The Europeans, bless their soul, often demonstrate it as in the top left picture. The Europeans, being European-centric, think this is all about connecting Europe with China. And they get all excited when a new train line goes from Beijing to London. Forgetting completely the new train line that goes from Beijing to Afghanistan, Com forgetting completely the train line that's about to open from Shanghai to Karachi, the new port that's already been opened in Karachi, the new port that's been opened in Djibouti, the new air link that links Kashgar and Islamabad. In fact, the top left picture is not that accurate in showing what's actually being connected. What is actually being connected is this bottom left picture. But why am I getting so excited about Sub-Saharan Africa? third fastest growing economic region in the world. Five of the seven fastest growing economies over the last 15 years have been sub-Saharan Africa, off a low base, 
but they're growing. Second fastest growing region of the world is South Asia, about to become the fastest growing region of the world, taking over from what is currently the fastest growing region, China, about to become the second fastest. In fact, one belt, one road is connecting the third fastest growing region with the second fastest growing region with the first fastest growing region, and none of it includes either the United States or really Europe. Because there's something fundamental changing. And to give you a good example about that is the top right picture. Just two weeks ago, the new Mombasa to Nairobi train line opened. Pretty excited about that. New logistics change and opportunities for you. But guess what's next on the list is building it from Nairobi through Kampala, one branch to Kigali and one branch to Kisangani. I don't know if you've ever heard of Kisangani, but Kisangani really is a it's not the world's most livable city, let me put it that way, in the middle of jungle in the Democratic Republic of Congo. But the other important thing about Kisangani is there is a single line, narrow gauge railway that runs from Kisangani to Kinshasa. In other words, you run into Kisangani, you've now connected Mombasa to Kinshasa. You've connected east-west across the African continent. It's astonishing, and this is being built now, and because it's not being built by the European cultures, Britain, the United States, France, Germany, we don't really get excited about it. It doesn't hit the headlines in the newspapers in the way that we should, because we are fundamentally changing the power dynamics of global trade by bringing Sub-Saharan Africa together with South Asia, together with China. And then RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. So the Americans stood up, bless their soul, with Trans-Pacific Partnership, and if I overgeneralize, Trans-Pacific Partnership was a uh, US-led free trade agreement through the Asia Pacific, but ignoring China. And Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership is a China-led free trade agreement ignoring the United States. Indeed, in some ways, RCEP and TPP were China and America's way of saying, choose sides, who are you backing? saying that to the Asia Pacific, to which the Europeans thought, Asia Pacific, oh, Tuvalu, Tokelau, Fiji, who cares? But the Europeans forget, actually, Asia Pacific is more than Tuvalu, Tokelau, and Fiji. It includes New Zealand, it includes Australia. Oh, then now they're starting to get interested. It includes Philippines, it includes Vietnam, it includes Japan and China. Oh, now they're getting interested. It includes Russia. How many people remember that Russia is a Pacific country? Vladivostok. And how many people remember the Pacific actually has two sides? So you flick across to the other side, Asia Pacific includes Canada, United States, Mexico, all of Central America, Peru, Chile. In fact, the Asia Pacific is so much more than Tuvalu, Tokelau and Fiji, it is 60% of global trade. Even the Chinese recognized they were gonna lose round one to the United States. RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, was all about positioning for round two in 2025 and 2030. And then my fifth cousin, once removed Donald Trump, a true story, get me drunk and I'll tell you how, decided he was going to get rid of the Trans-Pacific Partnership and to be fair, so was Hillary Clinton. In one decision, the United States took the entire Asia Pacific, walked over to Beijing and said to President Xi, here, yours. You're now the leader. Between One Belt, One Road and RCEP, China is taking dominance of Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, Asia, Asia Pacific. Tell me why we don't know this, why it's not at the top of our minds. And how fast is this happening? President Xi announced this policy in 2013, only four years ago. Now, if the Australian Prime Minister announced an infrastructure investment in 2014, I'd wake up 2013, I'd wake up in 2020 to see if any of it had been done, and the answer is probably not. But the Chinese have actually done a lot of this already. This transition I'm talking about is not a 200-year transition. This transition I'm talking about is a 20-year transition, and we're 10 years through it already. What we're seeing, the change, leading in times of change, the change we are living through right now is the most fundamental time of human change since the fall of the Roman Empire. And we're living through it. And not only are we living through it, we 
through the jobs we do, the education we have, the knowledge we have, we can influence it a little bit each day. We can make someone's health care a little bit better by understanding the logistics that's coming from this. The partnerships between so many of your companies that are helping economic growth and helping health and education outcomes in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, how much more are you going to be able to do it as this infrastructure investment unfolds, as this logistics network unfolds, and you can use it? Phenomenally exciting. The future. How will the future look? with One Belt, One Road fully implemented, with RCEP up and running. Even Singapore's, uh, Singapore's Prime Minister last week, in a magnificent example of Singaporean understatement, said the United States exit from the Trans-Pacific Partnership has hurt confidence in the US policy. Hurt confidence. Destroyed, blown up, I would use a whole bunch of other words. And now we're in this really super ironic position that communist China is the champion of global free trade and setting up a structure where they are going to dominate free trade economically, legally, and culturally. Some people will be scared by this. Some people will be full, full of hope for this. I'm ambivalent as to whether it's going to be positive or negative, but I'm excited that it's going to be. What's our role in it? How do we link profit, purpose and heart to this agnostic power of trade as we switch from European cultural dominance to Asian cultural dominance? Trade will continue through this once in a millennia shift. I would argue that flexible companies will survive both the cultural and the political shift. Companies that have within them different cultural mixes of their staff and work in different parts of the world and understand these different cultures are going to be incredibly well placed. And companies and people that understand as part of this cultural shift we need to keep linking profit, purpose and heart are going to be incredibly well placed. See this fantastic change that we're going through and really maximise it. So how do we keep profit, purpose and heart aligned? Well, my first bullet point here is really important. Are they really out of alignment? Do you know, there is so much cynicism about the private sector in our cultures at the moment that even the private sector is cynical about itself. How many of you think that your core business does good? We create corporate social responsibility programs, we give volunteer days, we try and do all of these wonderful things outside of our core business to motivate our staff to stay in our companies, to convince us because of our external, non-core business we're going to do good. And by implication saying that our core business doesn't do good. Since when? The single largest empower of humanity over the last 2,000 years has been well-regulated capitalism. It's got to be well-regulated, but capitalism has lifted people out of poverty. What's the only meaningful indicator of actually breaking the cycle of poverty? A process indicator is, are they healthy? A process indicator is, are they well-educated? A process indicator is, they've got lots of water. An outcome indicator is, have they got a well-regulated and well-remunerated job? That's how you break the cycle of poverty, is you get employment. You break away from the subsistence farming that previously had the economic world in balance, came out of balance through the Industrial Revolution, and now if we're going to bring people out of poverty in this new balance, we do it by ensuring people have jobs. The three sustainabilities. The social sustainability we talk about a lot, the environmental sustainability we talk about a lot, but there's got to be the financial sustainability as well. Question whether profit, purpose and heart works best if you understand the profitable side of your business can do good. It employs people, it increases trade, it increases investment. So long as you accept good regulation, it's an incredibly powerful thing to be involved in. We now call it shared value 
through Michael Porter and Mark Kramer's work, the work I'm doing at King's College beyond shared value, is say, how do we improve that even further? Let me give you an example. HL in Pakistan in 2005. I was chief of operations for the UN Emergency Coordination Center. A huge earthquake, 7.6 magnitude, 76,000 people dead, 3.5 million people homeless. Twice the scale of the tsunami, and I say that this way, people like to measure natural disasters by death tolls, but to be honest, dead people don't need help. You measure the size of a natural disaster by those who survived. The tsunami made 1.5 million people homeless. The Pakistan earthquake made 3.5 million people homeless. The tsunami happened in a flat coastal terrain. The tsunami happened in a mild climate. The Pakistan earthquake happened in a Himalayan terrain six weeks before 20 feet of snow was about to drop on top of people. It was a hell of a challenge. And with all this emergency aid coming from all over the world, the ports clogged up and the airports clogged up and people were about to die. And then DHL sent their emergency response team. And within a week, the port was unclogged, the airports were unclogged, and the logistics just hummed. And the secondary death rate in the winter following the earthquake was 811 people, which was lower than the normal death rate in that region in winter anyway. In other words, the quality of life of the people went up, largely because of the great work of DHL recognising their core skills in delivering logistics have at their heart the ability to do good. So if you really want to link profit, purpose and heart, keep these thoughts in mind. The agnostic power of trade survives great changes and we are living through one of humanity's greatest periods of change and for me, I find this so exciting because we're part of it. And the agnostic power of trade creates jobs. And well-regulated and well-remunerated employment ends poverty. It breaks the cycle of poverty. It lifts people out of subsistence farming. Well-paid people also increase markets, which also increases trade. And trade, as you all know, needs logistics. So here's the great irony. If you were wanting me to stand up and talk about profit, purpose and heart and talk about some great CSR program you could do or some good volunteer program you could do, yeah, I can do that. But where you're going to make the biggest difference, every single one of you in this room, is by doing your job and doing your job well because the core business of logistics links profit, purpose and heart. Thank you very much.